Hello and welcome back. Today we are going to start our journey with glazing our clay. There is so much one can learn about glaze and so many different things we can do. So we're going to start with the basics with two videos. This video, the first one, we're going to learn about underglaze and in the second one we're going to learn about overglaze. So here's some basic information you need to know. This is underglaze. Underglaze is basically colored clay that you're painting on the surface of your vessel. It is opaque, meaning that you can layer it, and whatever's on the top layer is what you'll see, and you won't see what's beneath it. It is mixable, so you can use it like paint. So if I've got blue and I've got red, I can mix it, and the outcome will be purple. Also, with underglaze, the color that you see in the jar is basically the color that you see in the end. It gets a little Deep, deeper, a little bit more rich as it fires, but it looks blue in the jar, so you can see a blue drip, and it's gonna look blue on the outcome. So opaque, mixable like paint, and it looks like what it's gonna turn out to be. Powder, or I'm sorry, liquid colored clay, that's basically what it is. Overglaze, which we'll go over next, functions very differently, and we'll talk about that in the next video. So today we're gonna talk about that underglaze. Remember it's called underglaze. It goes under the glaze. Remember it like that. Okay, it goes under the glaze. Um, in the course of the video, I'm going to talk with you about mixing it, applying it, how you can layer it to create different details, how you can blend the underglaze, and in the end, you can leave the underglaze raw, which will give a matte finish. So this is the little guy that I'm going to demonstrate on. This is what underglaze looks like if I just leave it fired. Do you see it's a matte finish? It's not shiny. Over the top of my underglaze on this side, I've put a clear coat of overglaze. That's what makes it shiny. So when you use underglaze, you can either choose to leave it a matte finish, or you can put a clear coat of overglaze on and have a shiny finish. In the end, it's a really versatile product. There's a lot of nice aspects to it. You can do a lot with the color. You can get very specific. The downside to underglaze is it doesn't pick up the texture. So this guy has been overglazed, which is the other type of glaze that we used. And if you look, you can see that that glaze has sunk down into the textural lines and it really accentuates the texture and it's a lot more interesting surface. On this piece, there was a lot of texture on this frog, but that underglaze almost covers it up. You don't see much of it anymore. It's really, really subtle. What's interesting about this piece at this point is not the texture that I put into it in the original um, building of the piece, but the glaze that I put on itself. That's where all the details are with underglaze. So make sure that you're making choices with underglaze versus overglaze that accentuate your piece and doesn't take away from the work that you did in your raw materials. Sit back, listen. If you have questions, feel free to contact me. I hope you enjoy this great way to add details to your finished piece. Let's talk first about setup. Whenever I'm glazing, I have a paper towel that I have under my object that I'm glazing. I have a bin of clean water. I've got a variety of different brushes depending on what I need for that current piece. Sometimes I'll have something that I can use as a palette or put a little glaze on, although we're really careful with this idea because glaze is really expensive. I also always have an extra paper towel to dry and clean my brushes off. For underglaze, um, I've got a lot of different underglazes I'm gonna use. Let me tip my camera. So I've got yellow and black and light brown and dark brown and dark green and light green and a chartreuse, which is a yellow green. You use underglaze like you use paint, so I can layer and mix it just like I would on an oil painting or an acrylic painting. So I'm gonna be using a lot of different colors with my underglaze. I want to make sure that my piece is clean and free of dust. So I usually rinse it off, um, which in the world of ceramics, that might make um, somebody cringe a little bit. But with my students, that's the best way for us to get dust off in a room that's used by so many different people. So you can rinse it off, let it dry, set up a little bit. Then I'm gonna get started. I'm gonna use this picture that my husband took of a frog in our backyard because I'm gonna give this to him as a gift because he'd take a picture every day this summer and post it on social media and just wrote, have a good day. And so this is his little Christmas present, his have a good day frog. I notice in this picture that 
the frog tends to have like a brown undertone. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just put one coat of brown on the whole frog, kind of like an underpainting. And I'm gonna put a coat of green on the lily pad. After I've got those coats on, then I'm gonna start to go in and mix paint and add details. So let me get that coat on and then we'll check back in and I'll talk with you about the next step. I forgot to tell you something really important. Before you use any jar of glaze, whether it's under glaze or over glaze, you've got to shake it up. And I've had horrible accidents in my room when kids shake it up because they forget to do something that's really important. When you shake your glaze, you put one hand fingers on top and then you hold the jar like this. So these fingers do this and then shake the jar really, really well. Don't forget to put these fingers on top of the jar because sometimes the person that used the jar before you did not attach the lid well. And if you don't do this and then you go to shake your jar, all the glaze squirts out all over the room. At least once a year I have a horrible glaze accident because someone doesn't hold that lid on. It becomes a hot mess. And if you talk to any art teacher who's taught ceramics and used glaze, they will have at least one story about glaze spewing across their classroom. So shake the glaze up, that's important, but hold that top on when you shake, okay? All right, I have everything with a base coat. The goal here is just to get everything covered. You can see there's areas where I got a little green where I didn't want green, but that's gonna get painted over anyways. I'm not gonna worry too much about that. At this point, I'm gonna start painting the basic colors of the frog and the lily pad, followed by the last details. So there's little black spots on it. The black spots will be one of the last things I do. The details on the eyes, the mouth, those will be one of the last things that I do. Nice thing about underglaze is because it's basically just a colored clay, more or less, you can glaze the bottom of your pieces when working with underglaze. Overglaze, don't glaze the bottom. Underglaze, you can glaze the bottom of your piece. I have a little plastic dish that I'm just using as a palette. I've poured out a little bit of glaze. Again, remember glaze is expensive, so don't over pour. And what I'm gonna start doing is mixing the colors that I wanna use on my frog. I noticed the back of the frog, minus these two ridges, is mostly kind of a dark brownish green. As it goes down through the legs of the frog, it becomes more of a brown color, less green attached. And then the ridges in the belly have kind of a lighter brownie green color. So these are the colors that I'm gonna to use to mix that up. You can mix this just like you would paint. And you can even go in and re-wet it and reuse it once it's dried a little bit. It's pretty magical stuff. I'm gonna pull a little more green into this color as I get to the back of the frog where it's the greenest. Um, and layer that in. The really lovely thing about underglaze for me is that I can treat it a lot like paint um, and I can do some blends on the body of the frog. Um, I can mix the paint to get the or the glaze to get the exact colors that I want in different places uh, and I can just really have a little bit of fun with it. Um, the downside to underglaze is it's opaque um, and so if you've got some really beautiful textures sometimes you can lose a little of those textures if you're not careful um, so that's something to just be aware of you don't want to lay it on too thick you do need two at least two coats of this underglaze to make sure you've got enough coverage that you don't see the clay underneath it um, you can do a little bit over two coats if you want to. Three is fine. If you've got a really dark clay and you're putting a light underglaze over it, you might want to have three coats. Or conversely, if you've got a really um, light clay and you're putting dark glaze over or underglaze over it, um, you might want to do three coats as well. Here I'm just trying to get the best basic solid coverage that I can on my piece before I start adding details. All right, I have my brighter green and my browner green about where I want them and at this point I'm gonna start doing some blending so I want this brighter green to blend in with the browner green and then it's gonna blend into a brown down here so to do a blend what I want to have is the two colors wet next to each other so I'm gonna have the browner green here and then my brighter green here and then where they meet I'm just gonna brush a little bit back and forth and that's going to blend them into each other. And then I'm going to blend that down. And then I need to blend this 
brown or green back into a kind of mid-tone brown. So I'm gonna mix a little bit of a brown over here, add a little bit of green to it so it's not pure brown, and I'm going to glaze the leg where that's gonna go. And I'm gonna be really careful where that meets the green of the leg above it. Then I'm gonna kinda of taper off with a dryer brush that brown into that green brown. I'm gonna rinse my brush and I'm gonna grab some of that green. And with a damp brush and a little bit of that green on my brush, I can kinda of move back and forth between that brown and the green and blend it out a little bit. So you see how that transitions from the green into the brown and then down here into more of the brown. Then this brown needs to transition into a lighter brown yet. So I'm gonna add a little bit more of that lightness to it and bring that into the toes. Again, being really careful where those colors meet other colors. And I'm just gonna continue going through a process similar to that for all of my legs. And then I'm gonna work on the back that has a little bit more detailed color variation in it. Take your time and use photo references if you're painting something realistically. You can also use a wet brush to kind of blend on edges that are fresh, just be careful, or you can kind of rub off the dry paint. At this point, I'm gonna go in and finish all of the color blends and get my frog ready for the details on the surface. There's a lot of dots and different textures on the surface of my frog. And before I start those, I wanna make sure that I've got the base skin underneath correct. Sometimes it's helpful to let the underglaze dry on all sides so you make sure your color matches before you begin the next steps. At this point, my frog is basically blended out and I'm starting to add the details of the stripes on his back. He has some lighter stripes that extend into the front along his eyes, and there's some darker brown areas along those as well. So I'm laying in the light and the dark brown directly onto the skin. Once it's there, I get it wet, and then I use a little brush and kind of dab it out to blend it into each other. So I apply the color, get it wet, dab it out. And you'll see me do this again on the back of the piece as he turns over here. Just take your time with details. The plus with underglaze is if you make a mistake, you can paint right over it and people won't see it. So don't get too stressed if it doesn't turn out right away exactly how you want it. Here I am adding those dark browns along the edge of the stripe in the back. And then you're gonna see me add water to this space and then use my paintbrush and kind of dab, dab, dab to blend it in so it's not such a hard line. That's where I'm kind of dabbing it in and trying to blend it a little bit, make it a little bit more natural. I'm gonna do that down both edges, both stripes on the back, and then my next step is to add the dots. Don't be afraid to experiment and try things with this, folks. It's just like using paint. You can paint right over it, you can blend on the surface as long as both paints are wet when they're on the surface, um, and you can even re-wet it once it's been painted. It truly is, like I said just moments ago, pretty magical stuff. Now I'm starting to add the dots. There's a little light green rim around each black dot. So the first thing I'm doing is going in and adding lighter green dots. I'll layer these in across the whole back of the frog. Once I have those light green dots on, then I'm going to paint black on top of it to add more detail. It takes some time to do this kind of detail, but trust me, in the end, it's so worth it. It's so much more interesting to have that there. Here I am adding the black. Um, you can see how that light green has dried a little bit. You can see it a little bit better. Um, take your time, have good edges, especially when you're doing something like black, because it is pretty powerful, strong stuff, and if you make mistakes, it's pretty evident. But you can see how this frog is starting to come alive. The more detail I add, the more interesting it becomes. So don't shy away from detail. I think maybe the worst thing you can do is go in and just glaze something all one simple color with underglaze. There's not much dimension to it until you add details. Here I'm adding black to the eyes. Make sure when you add that in that you've got really hard edges on things like the eyes. Now I'm going in with brown and I'm laying some brown in between each of the dots and then I'm getting the brown wet and kind of smudging it around with my brush and that just kind of dirties up the surface and it gives it a little bit more texture and it's a little bit more realistic. 
I go around the whole frog and I do this. I'm also going in and adding more details to the face, getting darker under the lips. Um, I noticed that the feet were a little darker than they appeared as the glaze dried, so I went up and darkened those, added more brown to the back of the legs um, because the legs were looking a little bit too green. So just going back and forth between my reference image and my frog, trying to make it as realistic and as interesting as possible. At this point, I finished up the majority of the frog itself. I still have the lily pad to do. When I do the lily pad, I'm gonna to need to be really, really careful on my edges as it meets the frog. I also take some time to turn this guy around and look at him from lots of different angles and see if there's anything that I need to touch up. I am gonna finish his eyes. Um, and this is usually the very last thing that I do, but um, with his eyes and a lot of animal eyes, they're basically just very, very dark black spheres. So I'll put a coat of black on while I'm painting and then I'll usually do one more coat just to make sure that I haven't got any um, residue from other colors or anything on there. Once I've got the black coat, I'm gonna put two little dots of white. Um, and that will make the eyes look reflective and it'll give them a lot of life. So I have a little paintbrush and I've gotten quite a lot of paint on there. And then what I'll do is I'll pop in and I'll just very gently, you could use a toothpick for this by the way, put a dot or two of white and I wanna get them in the same spot left to right. You see that little kind of reflective dot there it just gives them a little bit of life um, and at that point I would call this guy good at this point I have finished glazing I've glazed the lily pad um, this is under glaze so I could glaze the bottom Whenever you glaze or underglaze, you always want to look at the bottom of your vessel and make sure that it looks good. If it's overglaze, you want it to be clean, no overglaze. Underglaze can be on there, but just make sure you don't have a splotchy mess on there. That's not good craftsmanship. I've looked around my object from lots of different angles just to see if I've missed a spot. And because there's so much going on here and so many different angles and viewpoints that one could look at this, it's really easy to miss a spot or to make a little mistake somewhere and not notice it. So at this point, I'm gonna put this guy in the kiln, I'll fire him and I'll show you him when he is done. Now it is time to clean up your mess. Here is the frog with underglaze after one firing. And you can see that the color's gotten a lot more rich, a lot deeper, um, and it's really fired up nice. Underglaze has a matte finish, meaning non-shiny finish. And you could leave a piece like this if you want, if that matte finish works for you, for your animal or your vessel or whatever it is that you have used your underglaze on. You could certainly leave that matte finish if that's the best bet. For me and this frog, I'd like him to be shiny. So I'm gonna put two coats of this clear transparent glaze on. The glaze looks pink right now, but once it's fired, it undergoes a chemical reaction and it will be perfectly clear, lovely and shiny. So I'm gonna put two coats of that on and I'm gonna make sure that as I'm putting it on, I get it into all the little cracks and crevices. I'll load my brush up with quite a bit of glaze so that I can force it down into those crevices. You really wanna make sure when you're putting on a overglaze like this, um, and overglazes are a mixture of a liquid, water, and some other components um, with the same types of materials that one makes glass out of. And when it gets fired, those solids that are suspended in the liquid right now will melt and turn into a glass substance that covers your entire piece, and it will be shiny. Um, and if I have any gaps where I don't have that overglaze, I will have the matte finish showing through and it becomes quite obvious. So make sure that you're careful when you start layering up those overglazes on top of the underglazes that you have full coverage. You could potentially just do the overglaze on parts of it and leave other parts matte. Um, which might have a neat effect, like let's say you made a little dog and you want his nose to look wet but his fur to look that matte finish. You could just do a couple coats of the overglaze on the fur, or I'm sorry, on the nose, um, so that his nose looks wet and shiny. Or maybe you do the nose and the eyes, so the eyes have that look of the, the moisture that one has in eyes. Um, 
you just want to take your time and layer it up slowly. I have my students overglaze their piece with the clear transparent during the same stage they do the underglaze. Um, so they'll overglaze it um, while the underglaze, ha before the underglaze has been fired. And that works out just fine as long as you don't um, overbrush. If you overbrush, you start to liquefy the underglaze underneath the overglaze and it moves around on you. All right, I know it looks like I'm painting Pepto-Bismol on this piece. You have to trust me that this fire's clear. Every year, my students are nervous. They trust me, but they're still nervous. I've got one coat of that underglaze all over my piece. I'm gonna double check to make sure I've covered everything by turning this in multiple directions. And another thing that you want to note is when using overglaze, you should avoid glazing the bottom of your piece because this will liquefy in the kiln and then solidify as the kiln cools and stick your piece to the shelf. So I'm gonna avoid getting any overglaze underneath here and I'll go in when I'm done and kind of clean up the bottom so that there isn't any possibility that my piece will stick to my shelf. Once this has set up a little bit, so it's looking a little bit more like this where it's dry and um, opaque, I'm gonna go in and do a second coat all over um, and then potentially a third depending on how thick the two, the first two coats are. When you're doing your second coat, you wanna make sure that you don't overbrush it because it'll liquefy and pull off the coat underneath. So just do simple brush strokes, layer it up, make sure you've got full coverage on this coat as well. All right, my frog is finished. And at this point, the last thing I'm gonna do is come into the bottom of the frog and I'm just gonna clean off the overglaze. I wanna make sure that I don't have any in the spaces that are gonna to touch the shelf. So I've got a nice little clean edge of the overglaze here. My lily pad does lift a little bit at the edges, so I'm pretty safe, but I'm just gonna come in and brush that out just a little bit, just to make sure that it doesn't stick to my kiln shelf. And at this point, I can put it in the kiln shelf, and when it's done being fired, I'll show you the outcome. Here is our glazed and finished frog. That overglaze richened the underglaze yet again. You can see that there's a nice wet look to it, which works pretty nice for a frog. And I'll put some side-by-sides of what it looks like with the fresh underglaze, the fire underglaze, and the glazed underglaze, so that you can kind of see how the colors change over time. Enjoy, have fun, and take your time.